Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today, I'm really excited to be joined by David Lowbridge Ellis. David is a school leader in the West Midlands. Um, David, could I just get you to introduce yourself to our listeners and tell everybody what you do? Yeah, so uh, until a few months ago, I was at Bar Beacon School in Warsaw, uh, where I've been for many years. But um, in that time, I've been working across our trust, um, a small but perfectly formed trust called Matrix Academy Trust, uh, which we we set up here uh, some years ago. And um, I've I've spent I'm, I'm now formally working across the trust, working on school improvement. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do day to day. So, so um, yeah. yeah. So I'll catch up on that in a second, but I guess just for listener context, we first connected, I suppose, when I discovered your, or I, I think you sent it to me originally when I was doing my research for Just Great Teaching before the pandemic, mm. a couple of years back. And you had on your site at the time, 47 things that you do to support teacher workload. And I wrote about it and you kindly agreed and I put it in my book and I actually came back to it last month and I thought, oh, I just want to check, see how you're going. And uh, I'd just like to unpick that for listeners because we know workload is just a thing that always drives teachers crazy. Oh. It's a constant burden. But I, I guess I want to just evaluate some of the things that you said that you did. Mm. And, mm. you know, two years later, what what worked? What needed refinement? What did mm. you throw away? Anything new that emerged? So I've got a big list here if you're happy for me to read them out. But before yeah, yeah. we get into that, could you just, you know, give me the, the background story to how it's happened? So, as I wrote in the original article, I saw, I think it was John Thompson who posted online that he'd come up with a list of 20-something things. And yes. uh, the last thing I ever want this to be uh, is an arms race to try and outdo each other with the number of things, <laughs> which is one of the reasons, actually, one of the changes I've made to it is I've taken the number off it. Right, so, although, okay, it, interesting. although it appears in your book. Um, with a number on it and it appears on the department for education website with your number on it um yes. there, uh, with with that number on it i've actually taken the number off because even though yeah i didn't want it to be that well, we, yeah it can be viewed as a not work if you amalgamate two issues into one and you go down people might view oh it's not worked <laughs> exactly <laughs> because they... rather than profession <laughs> And we'll get into the detail in a minute, but those things aren't necessarily equal. Obviously, some of them are going to have much more of an impact than others. So sure. I just saw this list. And I, I just, to be perfectly honest, because I'm really sad, I just kind of sat there and made yes. a list of the things that we we did as a school. Uh -huh. um, and the more I wrote, the more I thought, actually, not necessarily, some other schools will be doing these things. Some schools will be doing uh, different things. But yeah. I thought it would be I thought it'd be useful just to kind of make the list. And I was doing some work with the Department for Education at the time, which I've carried on doing recently, actually, on uh, what eventually became the Teacher Workload Reduction Toolkit. Yes. And um, the more I kind of did that and did presentations across the country and talked about some of the things we did, the more I realized some of those things were quite special, uh, not necessarily unique to us, but some of them were. Um, yeah. But I came to realize that there were there were things that I assumed everybody did, but I wanted yes. to kind of get tr almost try and you well, know. Uh, now you've got your trust lens uh, going yeah. around different places. You've got a wider lens that actually it's not the case. People aren't doing all these things. But can I just mm. park this for a moment? Let's mm. uh, what I do in my podcast is let's get a little synopsis of who you are. So describe your sixteen year old self to everybody. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> so I was a uh, complete geek at school, always yeah. was, still am. Uh, goody two shoes. I wouldn't necessarily say teacher's pet, uh, but I used to find any excuse to try and avoid going outside at lunchtime because I was never been like a sporty type. So, uh, you know, if a teacher wanted me to help me with their displays and things, that would be it. I'm, I'm not creating a very pleasant picture of myself okay. here. I'm, so, uh, so what happened after school then? Uh, let, let's go up to kind of college, university. Level. Well, yeah, um, uh, um, a, a part of this is unfortunately um, 
it's not it's not a bad thing that I'm gay, but at the same time, I I did and I've written on there's articles on your website about this, yeah, um, which which you kindly published to, again to try and get those messages out there. But that uh, I didn't have a particularly happy time at school, if I'm brutally honest, yeah, um, and I was always quite an insular kind of introverted sort of person, so mm -hmm. I didn't go very far away for university uh, either, uh, but I did kind of enjoy university and sort of find myself a little bit. I did a degree in English uh, mm -hmm. at the University of Birmingham. So that was half language, half literature. Okay. Um, and then I decided to become a teacher because I couldn't think of anything else to do, to be perfectly honest. So it was never anything I sat there and thought, um, you know, if I, if I ever sat there and thought of, you know, I want to be this in the future, it was train driver. Uh, but you know, like a lot of so people. Let's, let's, I, let's, let's speak yeah. up teaching profession for a moment. You're still yeah. doing it. So what keeps you there? Um, I can't imagine doing anything else. And that's mm. not from a lack of imagination. I just find um, it it's, it's brilliant at giving you a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I, I can't imagine any other job giving you that sense of purpose. I do sometimes mm -hmm. kind of think oh maybe you know I could be a postman that seems really nice in terms of having a sense of purpose uh, you know yeah. bringing parcels <laughs> to people that go, I'm sure there are lots and lots of jobs that bring, give people purpose but it's like it's like instant purpose I think yeah. that actually is at, the, is, at the, is at the heart of a lot of workload issues actually with some teachers sure. which, um, and that they, because they feel a sense of vocation and because it is one of those things you almost when you start it, you feel there is nothing that mm. that beats the high, the natural high of imparting well, you'll, you'll, knowledge. You'll know with your leadership, yeah. you know, juggling balls that you've got a wide range of skills now uh, um, that far beyond the perception of just you're in a classroom with kids and, and whatever else. So we'll, um, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, university. So where was your first job? Where was your first teaching job? Uh, it was well. I, I did. I did teaching practice at a um, a school in the, in the centre of Warsaw, and then uh, one uh, not that much, uh, for, not that farther away. In fact, uh, pretty much the building I'm in now. Right. Um, um, so uh, yeah, I, I that was um, <clears throat> eighteen years ago. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I've been uh, I've been teaching. So my, I, my first lesson and trainee teachers that I do sessions with. Don't, lesson was on a chalkboard yes there was still that one there but i was also yes. the first teacher to ever use an interactive whiteboard at well there school. you go i think I so was my it was at that well. kind of <laughs> that transition point really so uh yeah i, I mean what, what's your subject david uh i'm an english teacher at heart although yeah. i've taught most things like many of us i've taught many things over the years i mean teaching on the blackboard's hard but you know having to do technical drawings the night before and telling people not to rub it off as your kids came the next day was always a challenge on the blackboard but there oh, we go yeah. we're, in a, we're in a technical era now um yeah so uh, when did leadership first happen for you um i think i was five years into the profession which again mm -hmm. i'm never a fan of kind of competing but at the same i, I understand that was so relatively soon um yeah, okay. yeah and it was partly because of the circumstances of the, of the school at the time um yeah. prob probably because uh the the school it was then for the first few years of my career was in an Ofsted category um mm -hmm. and i think the the team that came in and uh, i work with many of those people um still uh, but the team that came in recognised the teachers who were kind of, you know, doing the business sort of thing. So mm -hmm. in a sense, I think that was kind of advantageous because I got sure. the opportunities because, mm -hmm. you know, they were there to to do things outside of my own classroom. Mm -hmm. So because I got those opportunities and I seized those opportunities, I think it was recognised that mm -hmm. actually he can communicate to a, a broader, you know, a teacher, an adult audience mm -hmm. and can kind of drive things in terms of school improvement, which is what I'm doing today. Day yeah. To day. So now you're, so now you're uh, what's your specific title of the Matrix Trust? So it's uh, Deputy Director of School Improvement, which okay. sounds so fancy. So what 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 what's your you know obviously pandemic and stuff but what you know what are you doing week to week you know visiting schools working with certain yeah individuals so I'm trying to split my time evenly between our different schools so um, and uh, I spent quite a lot of time this this term in a school that we took over um, earlier this year in the summer 
uh, which was uh, in in special measures, and uh, we've we've we're taking several schools out of special measures, mm -hmm. so we're kind of applying what works there, but obviously customizing for context. Context. So yeah, I spent a lot of time there, particularly in curriculum stuff, but also behavior stuff, whatever right. needs doing, essentially. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. And I guess you know some of the things that you're seeing and learning from you know visiting multiple uh, different venues and working with a wider range of teachers has been a, an interesting learning curve. Uh, a really interesting learning curve. As I say, there are some things that we, what's that Dylan William quote about? Nothing works. Everywhere, Nothing works but everywhere, but it works somewhere. Yeah, that's a, the one, and that is so true. Um, yes. And I, I see. I'm. I, I consider myself really fortunate because I get to see schools in different contexts across my week it's never boring yeah so it's about translating your best ideas and thinking right what what might what can i take here what can i try there um yeah it's always always a fascinating aspect so let's come back to this workload thing i've got the list up in front of me um if we we start with the kind of teaching and learning part of your yeah. original mm. 47 ideas um I, I guess rather than going with kind of visionary things, for example, we trust teachers. Mm. Let me go mm. to some specific ones. So number three yeah. on your original list was no lesson plans of any kind. So, yeah. you know, did that live out uh, at Bar Beacon? Yeah. Uh, is it something that can live out across the trust or in that special measures school case? Is there a little nuance required? Um, it's something we that Barbie can have. We've never gone back on. No one mm -hmm. ever produces a lesson plan of of any description. That doesn't mean you don't plan your lessons, but it means yes, you don't of course. Lesson plans. Um, there have For been schools else, which yeah. we yeah, there have been schools we've taken over in special measures where the principles of planning weren't robust enough. Mm -hmm. But um, and we have kind of trial versions of lesson plans, like five minute lesson plans to try and embed those principles, but always yeah. with the aim of it's like a, it's like in a lesson when you model for the pupils and you include scaffolds. It was always there as a, as a supportive measure. And yes, it does take a bit longer for practice mm -hmm. teachers to fill in even a five mm -hmm. minute lesson plan. But with the goal always of taking mm -hmm. that away, which is what we stood by. OK, I've got another one for you. So th there was uh, another one you said no one covers more than one less than a half term. I suspect through the pandemic that, like, that's been a real challenge, hasn't it? It has been a challenge, to be perfectly honest. And um, certainly at the school where I am physically right now, staff have been amazing at pitching in where required. Um, and... Um, yeah, uh, it, it, it's it it is one of those which mm -hmm. we've managed to keep the school open without having to. I know some schools due to lack of capacity yeah. had to send. Them obviously, before the group. pandemic, that this was something that you could honour, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Just have it on paper. Yeah, so that's that's but great. Um, we still try to resist it as much as possible, though. We do keep very close tabs on how many how many hours people have covered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, let's move on to behaviour. So got, you've got two lines here. Senior leadership are visible and all staff mm -hmm. own their corridors and senior leadership run lunch duty. So behaviour doesn't bubble up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, both, both still true. I must admit, I, I edited this recently just to kind of and I thought this is going to be a big job. And it only took me about 10 minutes because right, well, actually most, most <laughs> of the things we've actually managed. And, and I think that's the crux of it, really. Yes. What we tried to do was tackle the things that really did make a big impact. So one of the mm -hmm. things that I took out of the 50 things, uh, 46, 47, 50, however many it's got to, I think it's 52 or something like that now, I've lost count. Yeah. But one of the things I took out was the thing about Zumba lessons. Right. Uh, <laughs> because I was just like, we don't do that anymore. But also, that was the only thing that I felt that was in the list, which was just kind of a bolt on, something that you stick on for well-being rather than being, yes. if you're going to, I always it, think it, if you're going to tackle embedded, well-being. Yeah. You need to do the stuff that's embedded. So if we go back to behaviour, uh, yeah, senior leadership are really, really visible. We spend l very little time in offices, um, certainly while the pupils um, are are in school. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, lunch duty, yep, we do yeah, lunch good, duty. Okay. No but one let, else. Let, yeah, sorry, it's really boring, few... isn't it? Because it's no, no, I, I, you know, workload for me, very passionate topic. As you'll know, yeah. it drives a lot of people crazy. Yeah, and totally. some schools that do quite the opposite. So it's an important yeah. issue. 
couple more on assessment and reporting. So the, the one important mm -hmm. one was give feedback however you think best policy, which I yeah. love. Mm. So talk about that. And then the second one, no detailed reports to parents, no detailed written reports. So let's talk about the feedback policy first. OK, yeah, um, just be warned, I could talk forever, so I'll try to be succinct <laughs> because this is the thing I've worked most on with the DfE um, and across uh, many of our schools, because I, I in, mo in most schools, it tends to be marking which teachers identify. If you do any form of survey or focus group, it tends to be to be yes. high on the list. So the aim is to mark a set of books in under an hour or whatever it is. Sometimes, you know, if it's mock exams, like English mock exams, are the worst they take about mm -hmm. three and a half hours per class set they're awful uh but um yeah we we still we still stick to that and that is the aim and most people accomplish that funnily enough one of the schools that one of our other schools the other day in fact it was the it was the one in in special measures they've got some match as you always find with any school whatever the ofsted rating there are some amazing teachers at those schools of course yeah of course and the, the, there was an one of the teachers i was talking to was saying i set myself a goal of marking you know um uh of being able to be able to do whole class feedback after reading through the books for 20 minutes i was like mm. okay that is an ambitious goal uh but then i actually saw what deal the kids were getting and i went and talked to the pupils in his lesson and they were getting a fantastic deal so mm -hmm. i always I, it's one of those things like with like most of the really serious workload issues that you you need to encourage staff to try doing it even better than they mm -hmm. are already uh, mm -hmm. i know that sounds really really cheesy but if you give staff the license to think of the more effective ways to feed back as long as it works and you check it's working by asking the children, you know, what do you need to do to improve? And, sure. um, you know, what are you doing well already and how can you build on this? Those sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. So a metacognitive approach, then then that's how that's how we approach it. I know so a lot of leaders are... get nervous. Yeah. Have we unpicked the special measures context? We don't need to go into details of yeah. the school, but how do you see the feedback policy immersing from bar beacon over to perhaps the good and the bad aspects of what could be used elsewhere that's a really good question because what you don't want to do is just transplant something that works at one school and the surface level features and you mm -hmm. end up um you end up transplanting it and it doesn't work because people do strategies you know a feedback approach but unless you understand the principles of effective feedback it's going mm -hmm. to call fall completely flat on its face so what we've been doing is we've been doing before you know saying this is a strategy you could use making sure that teachers understand the principles of effective feedback such as and i could i promise i won't go on all day but such as you know feedback is something that you don't just schedule at the end of a unit feedback yes. is something that happens every single moment of every single lesson and yes. making sure that staff understand that otherwise whatever strategy you implement is not going to work Oh man. So what about the written reports? Um what 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 does that look like today? And I guess a second question, um, what would be your advice to schools that still push out three three page reports? Uh don't. Uh, <laughs> because um they're usually not worth the paper that they're written on. Um mm -hmm. So what we again, what Bob Beacon have done for years and what our other other schools have uh, um now do is we make sure that uh, have regular updates and it usually is three updates through the year in terms mm. of uh, where their pupils are at so key stage three we've we've done it lots of different ways over the years to be honest and we it's something we always make sure we bring up with our parent forum because we want to make sure that we're giving them the information that they need but it tends to be the numerical information um, so right. what teachers enter during data drops. Sometimes that can be translated into words. So they're working at, above, below, et cetera. Um, but if you if you do all the stuff around the numbers and you do, so we've done explanatory videos over the years, a dedicated mm -hmm. part of the website, there's the feedback um, approach which we take. So we say encourage your, we educate the parents on asking your children about what they're learning and what they can do to improve. So it's not just, you know, taking something completely away, but it's putting all those other things in place, which actually do make mm -hmm. a lot of sense um, so that you can take away the things that, you know, reports taking weeks to write. And by the time they're published, they're completely out of date. Sure. 
Um, now, uh, two more themes. We'll talk about um, lifestyle and professional developments, I guess, the big one. Um, what, what does your CP, you know, pandemics distracted all of this, but what, what, what was the general rhythm of CPD at Bar Beacon before p the pandemic? The general pattern is um, allowing a system that um, is responsive to need as it arises. And I think because we had that model already, I think it was it was something that we were set up quite well for during COVID. So in terms of mm -hmm. brass tacks, what we do is we do um, mostly disaggregated days and we do those as hour long twilight sessions, usually every couple yes. of weeks because it's too yeah. intense doing it every week. And then people have the the training days off in lieu. We do sometimes yes. have training days and we did take advantage um, last September 2020 of the extra training day we were allowed. And, you know, that was that was really beneficial. Mm -hmm. But I tend to find with training whole days, you don't have as much impact and you can't be as responsive to need. I, I do no. plan the CPD calendar in advance. But mm -hmm. and to be honest, it doesn't change all that much usually. But as other priorities arise, you can kind of move things mm -hmm. around. So COVID and, and you've also got. Um, can mm -hmm. I introduct okay. introduct you briefly there? So um, mm -hmm. you you also mentioned in your uh, original list that I guess the NQTs also have a voice. So is that still the case? And we'll talk about the COVID aspect of CPD in a moment. But can your NQTs stats con stat stand up confidently and present ideas? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we've got funny enough, we've just had we've just literally this afternoon, we've had a uh, CPD, which I partly led with another colleague and someone mm -hmm. who's only been teaching for a couple of years, but has mm -hmm. recently taken on their first position of responsibility, um, whole school. Um, and she stood up there along along with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have no, and perhaps it is my own experience of being that person who'd only been teaching for two to three years. I think I have my first position of responsibility, which was this is how insane the kind of school <laughs> school was before it was uh, taken over. I was given whole school literacy responsibility, I think, as an NQT. Right, so, crikey. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Um, but at the same TLR's time... TLR's flying out all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> totally. You find it everywhere, don't you? But, as you know, there might be, towards the end of this year, there might be some of our ECTs, for year one ECTs, yeah. who maybe maybe starting to you know is sure. that they are those stars of the future that's good and, and so we we just uh, interrupt you before you were talking about covid uh, obviously there's all the headaches that have associated but let's just keep with the cpd theme how has that mm. shaped up from march last year all the way through to here where we are a year and a half later to be honest, we sort of kept the same model. Now, obviously, quite a bit of it had to be moved online. And obviously, other priorities interceded, particularly around teacher assess grades uh, mm -hmm. and the year before centre assess grades. So we had mm -hmm. to do we had to allocate a lot of CPD time to things which were absolutely necessary rather mm -hmm. than necessarily being the development priorities that we really the wanted. School, yeah. Sure. But it was getting it was getting that balance. Um, but the the model essentially stayed the same. The okay. Content, well, that, well, that's a good sign yeah. that um, you know you've got a lot of things that are an embedded part of your culture. Yeah. Now the lifestyle one, you know, that headless chicken. There's no prizes for looking busy or staying late. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the pandemic and workload and teachers working, you know, fifty plus hours. School leaders, you'll know, working eighty hours a week. How does that shape out? You know, if you're cutting away lesson plans in Bar Beacon, for example, mm -hmm. I'm going to gain a bit of time there and probably use some of my time to do s other things. Um, it, I, I just want to, is it more than just words? It's it's not. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Ross. Um, it, it isn't more than just words. What I would just caveat that with, though, is senior leadership. And I know that we weren't alone on this, but senior leadership hours um mostly due to things like contact tracing i'm not i'm not yes. kidding there was i did a, i did a little poll on this on twitter um, right. back in july because I, I thought are we alone on this this is not getting mainstream media coverage mm -hmm. and i was getting a, i was getting fed up to be perfectly frank um about that um senior leaders i mean one week i'm not kidding we clocked up at least 40 hours so what did you survey leadership. just out of interest that of schools were spending about 40 hours a week doing contact tracing in the summer term yeah that's crazy 
And then the, the majority about, I think it was about 60% were doing somewhere between 50 and 40, 15 and 40 hours. Mm -hmm. So we were sort of, um, we weren't alone. There were a quarter of other schools that were like us. But and we were being really diligent with the contact tracing. We were going through mm -hmm. seating plans with a fine tooth comb. Everyone sure. took at least two hours. So About, we yeah. were we would we were we were re and it, as a result, we managed to keep the school um, uh, uh, more full of pupils than we than than many other schools. And that's not passing judgment on any other schools at yeah. all, because like every other school, we were you know we were substantially reduced by the end of the summer term. So I guess but, the message is you know don't do the silly things but we you, obviously with covid you had to do the things you had to do and, and there was a w bit of a workload issue that you couldn't avoid regardless we couldn't we and it was it was just something we couldn't move so some of the things that we did to adapt for instance is that i didn't want to stop doing any form of lesson drop-ins and giving feedback to teachers on how to improve so we had to adapt our systems to be able mm -hmm. to do that because we did have all this necessary COVID stuff, but we wanted to keep everything going that we, we wanted to have our cake and eat it, basically. And yeah. I'm not going to lie, it was a challenge, but we, we took the approach that actually, if this is taking too much time, like we always do, we've got to find mm -hmm. a more efficient way of doing it. Sure. Um, now, you've also uh, let me pick up uh, on where we started at the, at the start of our conversation. You mentioned Zumba. Uh, so you've got in-school health events, flu jab, yoga, You've, you've mentioned, you know, where the seasonal events, where the less serious side staff get dressed up for World Book Day. And you've also got the international visits. Obviously, they perhaps haven't happened, I suspect. I, you know, Iceland, Martinique, uh, Greece. Well, we've fingers crossed for next year. All right. Well, fingers crossed. So um, I, I, what does the well-being stuff look like at the moment for your staff? Um, the I will just say, in the interest of full disclosure, the yoga has also disappeared from the most recent <laughs> version. Uh, just yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the the, the no, less serious. COVID, was that, is that a COVID headache or a logistical or people weren't? Uh, the member of staff who was doing it um, is um, on maternity at the moment. Right. Okay. <laughs> so well, there you go, but, but also, you know, it was it was you know something that that member of staff had to um had to spend time doing so sure. it wasn't necessarily fair and i know we, we did we did almost like a, a, a list of well-being things mm. but i go back to what i said earlier to, to really impact the well-being of staff you really need to tackle workload um and I, I know there are things you can you can do we still do the flu jabs and all that what that we had another one this year as well um mm. and, the, and and that sort of thing but um you know the pantom hopefully you know if we're allowed Panda. to do big gatherings the pantomime Nativity is happening. Play. <laughs> yeah no we don't not in not in we're a secondary not, but not we, we don't no no um so, so i guess you know lessons learned and where you are with your role now how do you see your influence in workload being shifted to across the trust in with schools in different contexts is that something that's part of your brief or just a passion you no know, absolutely it's definitely part of my brief so everything we implement it's always try it, I, I the most important thing to do is before you introduce anything new and I know this is there in the things as well. I passionately believe this. In fact, I think I put it right at the bottom just to kind of underscore it. But the um, if you're going to introduce anything new, you've got to take something away or mm -hmm. make it more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the approach that we're, we're taking. And a lot of the times I, I do feel like I'm going into schools at the moment and I'm just kind of hacking and slashing, kind of going, no, you can't, not, not as kind of willy-nilly <laughs> as just hacking and slashing, but... We've overcomplicated this. So, you yes, know, you can, have. So, for instance, if you know, if we think about teaching and learning, people are told, put this in your lesson and it'll be a great lesson. It'll be an outstanding yes. lesson, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I'm just going in there and say, no, no, um, take it away. Yeah. What you want to do is check what the kids know about this already, teach them some new stuff about it, check that they've understood it, and then come back to it in future to make sure that it's going in their memories. That is yeah. it. That is that teaching. Is it. And if you Explain introduce anything question else, process feedback, yeah, it's, that's it. It's way too complicated. So um, that's a good point to kind of sum things up. Um, 
So that, that uh, and I guess the profession, and, you know, I know you're active on Twitter. We're in a much better place. I mean, we've still got plenty of things to do, but we're in a much better place, I guess, to when you and I first qualified. Uh, yeah, I would say so, because I, I know a lot of it is being an evidence-informed profession. I think I don't think we can really overestimate how important that is, even though still more evidence needs to be collected, as uh, the recent EF yeah. report uh, pointed out, you know, some of the things that we we consider to be evidence informed still need um, do, some, yeah. some rigorous evaluation. I, I, I think what, in a, I, yeah. Sorry, David, I interrupted you again. There. No, I was fault. just going to um, say we. Um, I was involved in a research project, a series of research project last year. Um, projects last year, where we actually did we did proper research into proper studies into making sure that anything we were implementing in terms of workload wasn't having a negative impact on pupil attainment. So we need to do even more of that. Yeah, and I, I think also there's a, a real shift for teachers becoming research literate more than anything, mm. you know, methodologies, whatever else. And even, you know, we find things that we don't like or necessarily can take and apply into our own school, you know, that going back to it works somewhere, but not everywhere. Mm. You know, there's the research in form, but being literate about research methods to be able to challenge them also, which, you know, some of the EEF things that we came out on retrieval practice still question that there's not enough robust evidence for us Absolutely. to, you know, keep pursuing it. And I think that, that definitely put a cat among the pigeons with, for all the retrieval practice fans. And I know I'm one of them. Um, let, let's sum things up then, David. So um, I, I, you'll know on my podcast that I kind of throw a few kind of fast paced questions at the end, kind of catch you off guard, a little kind of summary of all the things that we've covered. But I, I guess just before I come to that, I, I'd like to ask you a, a big question, I suppose. And I know the answer is going to be challenging and difficult, but if I just we just put back on our head, uh, you know, put a hat on in terms of the LGBTQT agenda. Yeah. What? And I know you've written about it on my site, and it's an important topic, you know. And I've also researched, you know, if you are, um, if you want to come out, it's much more of a struggle for people in isolated communities rather than the big yeah. cities. There are saying. Yeah. I'm not saying that it's difficult for people in cities, but. There was an interesting piece of research I discovered as part of your blog. I guess the question I want to ask is, you know, where is the dialogue for not you, but, you know, teachers, um, teachers who want to come out, people still ostracized, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You're the expert here. Give me some help. Um, mm. where, where do you see this conversation of being gay openly in a school is it still a tough gig for some people or is it a, a, we're in a better place? I guess the I, question I want to ask. We're in a better place than we were 18 years ago, the year I started teaching, <laughs> you know, when Section 28 wasn't repealed. Yeah, till then. So actually, even if I wanted to in the first, you know, before I started teaching, I wouldn't have, I, you know, before 2003, I wouldn't have actually had the opportunity to do so. And I wouldn't necessarily have had the support. Um, and I think that really... I think that nails it. Really. I think it depends on the school. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm part of the ASCOL um, LGBT um, group and we meet right. usually about every month. And it's quite interesting because obviously they're school leaders um, and obviously they're very on board and they're LGBTQ themselves. And I think that does make a real difference. But mm -hmm. I am seeing an increasing number of allies. I've done quite a lot of work with some primary schools recently. Um, right. Whose head teachers are not LGBT themselves, but they they really are passionate uh, about it. As you know, lots of teachers are really passionate about tackling racism, uh, prejudice against disability, and so mm -hmm. forth. But the appetite needs to be there from the senior mm -hmm. leadership team. I think. Mm -hmm. um, so because I was, um, yeah, I, I'm, I think it's quite difficult if you go into a school and they've not done much work on that. And I sometimes think that. I almost take it for granted that we've created a culture where it is absolutely, you know, absolutely yeah. I mean, I, I, the right. point I raise it is because, you know, you get, you're getting out to a few more skills. I see a lot of skills and I know that dialogue yeah. isn't the case everywhere. No, it's not. No, it isn't. And uh, I always warn teachers to choose the school very carefully. Totally. To your personal values and the school's yeah. vision and values. Um, all right, so that that's uh, you know it's a big topic. Maybe we can revisit that one in the future. Mm. Um, so let me wrap things up then, I suppose. Um, 
So we've covered your 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 kind of role, your origins into the teaching profession, which was an interesting story. Your your kind of role, what you're doing today, and then this big workload thing, and how it all you know has shaped out throughout COVID. I guess one final question on this is, what's still the workload key issue that you that you now perceive that still needs to be cracked? I think we really need to look at senior leadership workload. And I'm saying that obviously as a member of senior leadership, but mm -hmm. um, as far as I'm aware, we haven't, you know, got, um, we haven't tackled the succession, um, mm -hmm. you know, planning. And I think that a lot of, a lot of people might do, I'm not saying it for this school, but I've had conversations with people from other schools who are not senior leaders at the moment, but because of what we've gone through with COVID and because mm -hmm. we've had to adapt to so many changes um, out of necessity, I think some people don't necessarily see senior leadership as something no. they want to join. Yeah. And actually, if uh, again, apologies for interjecting, but um, the mm -hmm. latest education support research, the teacher wellbeing index, I found not surprised, I suppose, but also disheartening that school leaders out of all the different roles in education, you know, teaching assistants, support staff, et cetera, were the least likely to go and seek support. Um, and, you know, if I recall, my, you know, I'm sure you, this is all still yeah. very familiar to you, you know, 80 plus hour weeks, you know, if you're in a special measure school, we can't have any school leaders working part-time, you know, co-headship, still quite a rare thing actually as well. Mm. Um, so I, I guess, you know, going back to that top you know, question, wh what are your hopes for senior leadership specifically then? Um, I wish I had the answer, to be perfectly honest, Ross. I'm not sure what the solution is. And I have, as, as I say, I still work with the DfE and, the, and we've recently updated the workload reduction toolkit. It hasn't been published yet, but, we were we were all of us who were working on that were pushing of more of an acknowledgement uh, i think that's a really good start but an acknowledgement that you know the hours that senior leadership um have, have particularly have been putting in um mm. over the last couple of years um and what is really sustainable in the long term mm. so yeah, i i, I, I don't have an easy answer no, no, no. And, you know, when I when I did my deputy headship, I, I, you know, I, I loved the classroom. I was only doing six hours a week, but even still I was, you know, 60, 80 hours a week during term time easily. Mm -hmm. And that's without the, the normal workload you'd get if you were teaching 22, 25 lessons. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I guess it's, a, it's still a big nut for us all to crack on picking succession planning, yeah. uh, a, a good working, well-being life as a school leader and having a bit of a life also and shown that evident in school. Uh, so I look forward to the toolkit being published. Any rough idea when the DfE might do that? No, I'm not sure, to be honest. I th um, it will be in the next couple of months. They're currently contacting everyone who's contributed um, items okay. for it. Just to, All right, yeah, so we'll so, keep our eye on that. So um, let yeah. me wrap things up then. So I, I'll throw some whistle-stop questions at you now. Let's see if I can catch you off guard. So let, let's start easy. What project are you working on at the moment? What's on your desk? Uh, you can see my desk in there. I'm going to show you the gigantic piles of paper over there. Um, um, I think, oh God, I don't even know where to begin, to be perfectly honest. But I, I suppose in terms of uh, my own role. What, what's your next uh, big deadline? Um, again, <laughs> not, not even sure where to go, to be perfectly honest. I think, I th I, 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 I'm really enjoying getting to grips with the curriculum um, impact side of things. I oh, think nice. what lockdown did for a lot of us, um, even though we were incredibly busy during lockdown, I hate that myth that teachers were just sitting around drinking cups of tea in their bedrooms, in their pajamas and whatever. That certainly wasn't the case. I don't know about any, you know, I'm sure like a lot of leaders, I was actually yes. working longer hours outside Absolutely. the office than I was inside the office. But it sometimes also gave us a little bit more thinking space to do the curriculum intent side of things. Yeah. And what's really exciting now, although some people don't see it as as exciting, but I do, is seeing how that's then translated into the classroom. Brilliant. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is that tight looseness between this is the curriculum as planned. And then how do teachers, how, what kind of latitude do we give teachers 
to implement this in their own way. It's in our list of things we do. We do encourage teachers to teach in their own way. But at the same time, we've all got to be teaching the same thing. Yes. So that that's the thing that I'm okay. working on. That's the common thread. No offense. This is supposed to be quick fire. So let's let's sorry. Let's go this. <laughs> if finish this sentence, if you were education secretary of state, I would. Uh never miss an opportunity to acknowledge how hard senior leadership are working. Yeah, great. Um what what's the most useless thing you've bought online during the pandemic? Um useless. Thing. my husband's the special is the expert on buying useless things we've got so many remotes and pieces of technology in our lounge okay. i have no idea None of them working. So I'm, okay. I'm gonna say, i'm gonna say some of those things piece of advice for an, an early careers teacher who wants to become research literate what would you advise um follow the right people on twitter because it's okay. a great shortcut now, I'm assuming you do, you, you've you already said you're doing your best job ever, but if you had that off-the-wall wacky career that you could choose, what would it be? This is going to sound really maudlin. Um, I often think <laughs> that if you're talking about um, purpose and that kind of thing, funeral director. <laughs> right, okay. That's a, that's a very, very interesting uh, one. Um, I, think, yeah. I think you can have a real impact on people's lives. Um, yeah, no, you definitely. Because of death. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely could. Um, what's the last thing you experienced that made you laugh or cry? Um, I'm going to say the last James Bond movie. Right. I, okay, I, just, I, I just cry thinking <laughs> about it. <laughs> Who would you recommend I interview next and why? Um, within education, I presume. Uh, ideally, yeah. Otherwise, an education podcast. <laughs> I try to um, with an education focus. I try my hardest. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, I go with Taylor Swift or someone like that. All you right. Know, well, uh, I'll chase uh, Taylor. But yeah. let, let's let's keep it real. Any any education recommendations? Oh gosh. Um. Yeah. I go for um Claire Hollis, who okay, Claire does Hollis. really great stuff with diversity in the curriculum. All right. I shall look Claire up. Thank you. Um. Where, where can listeners find out more about Bar Beacon, your trust, maybe you on Twitter, et cetera? Well, give us some hyperlinks. Yeah, so Matrix Academy Trust is who I work for, and mm -hmm. the building I'm in right now is Bar Beacon School. Um, and you can, yeah, you can find out information about those just by uh, Googling those, or they're both .co.uk's. And I'm on Twitter, uh, David T. Lowbridge. Uh, Great. Team, and, uh, thanks, David. Uh, I guess, you know, a pandemic question. What, what's the pandemic taught you? Um, don't put off things that you're passionate about. OK. And my final question, what, what do you hope to be your legacy? I hope that, well, we've got loads of people who I've taught who come back to this school or our other schools. So I kind of see that as quite flattering, to be perfectly honest. I, di I didn't manage to put them off. Well, there you go. So um, thank you, David. There you go, listeners. Um, David Lowbridge Ellis, a school improvement leader in the West Midlands. David, thank you for your time. Thank you, Ross. And it's been really good to see how the Bar Beacon workloads moved on. I really look forward to the reduction toolkit being published. And uh, yeah, uh, I think we should revisit the topic on the LB, LGBTQ and, and see mm -hmm. uh, see what, what work needs to be done and see if we can support yeah, a few teachers out there. Um, thank you for joining me. Uh, all the best. It's a pleasure. Cheers, David. Bye now.